I'm Michael, and welcome to Beyond the Screenplay, the podcast where each week we do a conversational deep dive analysis into a film. Today, we are talking about A Quiet Place Part 2, written and directed by John Krasinski. I'm joined today by the Beyond the Screenplay team, Trisha Rand. Hello, everybody. Brian Bittner. Hi. <laughs> and Alex Galleras. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Before we jump in, our uh, question for people listening on the Spotify app is, what upcoming movie releases would you like us to have an episode on? Because mm. we have mm. movies coming out now. So Ooh. let us know in the Spotify app. Uh, and that just kind of rolls right into the first thing to talk about, which is that we were going to do this episode over a year ago, mm. back in March of 2020, we had our tickets bought. We were excited. It's like, all right, we're going to do an episode on Quiet Place 2 when it comes out. It's going to be so much fun. And then slowly things started changing and it ended up not coming out when it was supposed to for reasons mm -hmm. that don't need to be explained. But here we are and we all saw it and we all saw it in a movie theater, which is crazy. We're lucky and privileged to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. Kind of before we jump into the movie... What was it like to be back in a movie theater? Trisha, I know you like movie theaters. What was your experience? You know, I do really like movie theaters. It was awesome. I just, you know, I, I went with a friend to see it and we like made our plans a week beforehand and bought our tickets, you know, way in advance, basically. The whole week leading up to it, my friend and I were texting each other about how excited we were to go to the movies. <laughs> We met up that evening and like got a drink at the bar up the street, which is, you know, had a patio that was open. And so we just sat on the patio and had a drink and caught up. And then we strolled over to the movie theater and it was just like the before times. It was so <laughs> special. And, Isn't it amazing? <laughs> uh, what a joy. I did experience a little bit of the phenomenon. And you guys can tell me if you guys had any of this going on in your theaters. But I've been reading about the sort of lack of decorum that has kind of cropped up or like people have sort of forgotten theater etiquette a little hmm. bit hmm. after a year, more than a year of consuming entertainment in their own homes. They have sort of forgotten that they can't just be talking to, you know, their partner, or whoever they're sitting with, because they're used to being in a more, you know, sort of private environment. So we experienced a little bit of that. D did you guys have any of that going on? Yeah, it's interesting because I, um, uh, also, the theatrical experience was great, just going there and being in that space again and everything, and obviously seeing the movie projected theatrically yes. you know, and <laughs> everything like that. But then I did feel a similar thing. It was interesting because I would love in a perfect world to not have people around me in a movie theater, uh, which is what I got. Mm -hmm. But it also meant that there was a distance uh, of everything now right. where it was like, first of all, you don't feel like you are necessarily one unit watching this movie. You feel like you're a bunch of individual units. And I think because of that, I also got a little bit of what you're talking about, Trisha, where people just felt like, oh, we are in our own private space over here mm -hmm. so we can do whatever we want. And I didn't get a lot of that, but it was just almost more than I feel like I would have gotten in a packed theater, which seems ironic mm. and counterintuitive, right. but it, it was sort of like, oh, there's distance here. And then I got to go to the Million Dollar Theater in downtown LA to see a Kubrick uh, double feature, triple feature um, this weekend, which was pretty packed with some separation. So probably five times as many people in that theater as when I saw Quiet Place 2, but so much more just respect and focus and silence sense. and all that kind of thing, you know? So it's just an interesting kind of counterintuitive thing. Hmm. Yeah. That's, the, that's the arc light crowd right there. Right. That's who they are. <laughs> RIP arc light. Yeah. Ugh. Once again, if you don't know in LA, we had uh, <laughs> a, a very awesome like chain of theaters that was all about pristine quality, pristine sound and like no toleration for any hijinks. No cell phones, no talking. It cost more, but that was a way to filter out the plebs. It shouldn't be in a movie theater with the real film people. It honestly didn't cost that much more, actually, than like it's a true. lot of theaters now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Someone will yeah. save the arc light. I have faith. I, I believe yeah. in it. I'm scared that AMC is going to save them and just make them into AMC theaters, which will be the most tragic outcome. We are snobs. Yeah. We are so snobs. Quiet Place Part 2. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Alex, how was it? Well, I will say in my theater, I saw it at the recently reopened only theater now in my city of Glendale, <laughs> the Lemley Glendale. Nice. The Pacific Theaters is part of the same company that owns Arclight and they closed at the Americana. At the one theater in my town now, uh, I was able to see it and it was great because it was a relatively small theater, but it had really good sound. So it met my standards as far as quality. But it was a nice intimate setting where it was a packed theater as much as is allowed with COVID restrictions. And mm -hmm. 
the crowd at Lemley was a polite crowd. They were very quiet during the movie. They gave they were reacting in a way that was fun to the movie, but not in a way that was like their teenagers goofing off while I'm trying to focus on this film. So I really had a great time at the, at the movie theater. And it was it reminded me of just like this movie is the perfect back to theaters movie because Mm -hmm. it's thriller thrillers and horror films are the type of film you want to see in a theater because I definitely soak up the energy in a room and I definitely react to the energy around me in a room. And I have so much more fun than a movie like this when I can feel the people behind me next to me in front of me freaking out in certain Mm -hmm. key, key sequences. And I could definitely feel that even though they were kind of, they weren't right next to me. There was you had the little micro sounds in the theater, the kind of gasps and the <laughs> right, right. the the nervous noises, and I just love that in a movie like this. So I had a great time. It was so smart of them to hold this movie off and not put it on a streaming service, not put it on a some kind of VOD mm-hmm. thing over the last year because it really would not be the same alone at home. I mean, it'd be it'd be scary in a different way, maybe, but it wouldn't be fun in the way that the theater is so much fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I feel like it really was a good movie to return to theaters for. And I had some weird moments where I was like, I kind of do miss just being able to be at home. And like, I had to go to the bathroom and I was like, all right, I can't pause this. Like, (laughs) how dare this? Once again, we're also snobs because, yes, we're sad that we only have one theater in our town because that's what living in LA is like. Right. Right. And I also felt kind of uncomfortable. Like, wait a minute. Like, I'm just in a dark room with a bunch of strangers. Like, I felt like unsafe at first. Mm. Uh, mm-hmm. Anyway, but that's just Michael things. <laughs> yes. Once the movie started, I was super into it and it was really great and a lot of fun. And so I think let's dive into talking about this movie. And there's uh, a, a lot of things that I think are interesting about this movie as a standalone film, as a sequel to a movie, as a sequel to A Quiet Place, just how it is continuing the story. I was really curious about how much they were going to keep playing with sound and perspective. Mm -hmm. We made a video about the first A Quiet Place, and it was all about sound and how you use sound to tell a story and put you in the perspective of these characters. And obviously, Millicent Simmons' character, Regan, is deaf. And so in the first movie, there was a lot of opportunities to play with that and really make you connect with her, like perspective of the world. And there was some of that in this one, but I felt like there wasn't as much. And I guess if it's not clear, spoilers for anyone who Uh hasn't seen it, we're going to be talking (laughs) all about this movie. So if you haven't seen it, go see it and then continue. Yeah, that's kind of the first thing that I was noticing is that it was there, but the the quietness wasn't, I guess, obviously wasn't as novel and wasn't used in as, uh, you know, interesting ways in this movie maybe just necessarily because of the sequel nature. This movie's not that quiet. Mm -hmm. Generally, I think that if you rewatch the first one and then go to watch this one, which I rewatched the first one today because I just wanted to refresh my memory of it, um, having only seen it once before this, the first Quiet Place movie is incredibly quiet for most of its Mm runtime. Like There actually isn't that much music. The ambient sounds are just turned way down. There's hardly anything. There's a ton of just like little whispered conversations or mostly signed conversations. The sound is being used to do something, as we pointed out, very deliberate, where it has to do with the plot. It has to do with the pacing, all of this stuff, where the first movie keeps you at the edge of your seat by being quiet. This movie... Quiet Place 2 does not do that. It keeps you at the edge of your seat, but not because it's quiet. Mm -hmm. It's because there's like a lot of stuff happening all the time, basically. And there are some sequences where the quietness is, you know, integral to the plot, where a character is really trying to be quiet and you do find yourself doing that lean forward that you are doing for like an hour of the first movie. Mm -hmm. But I would say (laughs) if you actually looked at the amount of time where there's real quiet in the second movie, it's got to be a tiny fraction. I feel like it's, If you want to say like 50% of the first movie is quiet, I feel like 15% of this movie is quiet. Yeah. There's so much more going on. Yeah. And, you know, I think that's sad, but it also, I kind of forgive it in a certain way. I mean, I think there's, when you're going to make a sequel, right, that's always a very difficult ask is like, you did a thing once, we want the same thing, but it has to be also different. Like, you can't do it again, but do it again. Uh, And so I feel like 
that's something I'm always interested in when watching sequels or, or what are the things that they kind of have to leave behind mm -hmm. in order to tell a new story. And ultimately, I thought the trade off worked for me, but it was interesting to see that that the quietness was kind of left behind more so. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that you seem to be kind of talking about it as maybe a loss or a trade off, because to me, what I want from a sequel is something that evolves the world that brings me into a new place. And so I actually wasn't expecting from this movie a repeat of of like, oh, I want to make sure it's like quiet as much as possible to like have that exact same thing happening. It, it, mm -hmm. I went into it actually wanting more world building and like a bigger world to be revealed outside of this farmhouse and the the space we were, were occupying in the first movie. And the film is interesting because it does expand the world a little bit, but it's still very narrow and it's still yeah. very contained. And that was an interesting experience for me because I, I think from what I gleaned from the trailers and what I think I assume because of my preconceptions of what sequels tend to do, I thought it was going to be, we're going to learn a lot more about the whatever the people are that Killian Murphy says are not worth saving. You know, we're right. going to learn all about what their story is and we're going to find all about where this song is coming from in the island. And all of all of those details are kind of as insignificant in some ways as details in the first movie where it's it's really about this family in this place and the world building is pretty minimal actually and it was it was interesting to see this movie kind of both expand the world but just barely and, right. and not really concern itself with getting into the weeds with what's actually happening out there mm -hmm. yeah and i think everything you guys are saying is both what i liked and maybe didn't love about this movie which is I do appreciate when a movie is presented as part two, basically like this is literally what happens next 10 minutes later. Like we're just, you know, uh, Quantum of Solace or something like that, which is just like, here is 10 minutes past the credits of the last movie. Let's keep going. Mm -hmm. But I also think that what that does is it sort of asks you to think of it as two parts of one story. Right. If this is one long movie and the midpoint is we just figured out how to kill a monster, then you wouldn't want the climax and resolution to be, now we've gotten a signal out, right? You would want it to be, now we've killed a whole bunch of monsters. <laughs> like now, like <laughs> things are happening. You are actually seeing this. So I feel like, it, and maybe this will make a good act, second act of a three-part movie. Which it might be. Right. But it did feel to me like, I'm glad that they didn't just say like, now there's, you know, hundreds of these things and, you know, now they all have machine guns or whatever. Like it wasn't trying to do an <laughs> aliens, you know, mm -hmm. thing. But at the same time, I felt like what makes the first movie exciting is that it's fresh and original and unique and this kind of thing. So then when you do a part two, it's, okay, here's all the stuff that was fresh and unique and original before again, uh, and now it's not fresh, unique, and original again. And then usually, so what you want from a sequel, I think, is, well, now what can you do that is... It doesn't have to ratchet up the scope necessarily, but I think it has to ratchet up either the novelty. Novelty is sort of a negative word but you know uh -huh. so it's like what if the second movie was literally no one speaks for the entire movie or what if it was you know and i think that's where the sort of what you're saying trisha of like you wanted it to be sort of more quiet it's like one of the things that made the first movie kind of special was these great characters in this great setting and that yes. all we get yes, more yes, of. yes but one of the things that made it special was what if you had to be quiet what does that actually look like what does that actually feel like as an audience to watch this and the second one not only didn't double down on that it almost either backtracked on it or sort of kept it at the same level, which again, kept it feeling like a fine, here's just another chapter in this story, but almost like an episodic TV show thing than a, here is a very satisfying everything you want from a sequel sequel for me. Well, first of all, I didn't say that I wanted it to be quiet. I was just pointing out that it's not that quiet. <laughs> or just, you know, there was like a different expectation, I think. And part of it is exactly what you're talking about, where it's like, well, double down on something, right? So whatever it is that you're going to like turn the volume up on, sorry. Uh. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just do that more, right? And like pick an aspect of it, do it more. Or, you know, we did a video about James Cameron sequels where we compared T2 to Aliens. And one of the things that we talked about is like same premise, different designing principle, right? Mm -hmm. So, and I actually think A Quiet Place Part Two does that, where I would say A Quiet Place Part Two is more of an action thriller as opposed to like sort of a horror suspense thing. Right. Like I was way more comfortable watching A Quiet Place Part Two. Like yeah. I prefer my action sequences over my 
like sort of, you know, jump scares. Scary, and, yeah. yeah. There are some. There are some jump scares, but <laughs> I had a really hard time watching the first one. But I think the first one relies on suspense, right? It's very much like drawing out the tension and keeping the monster sort of in the dark and you don't see it. It's over there. It's going to come. Oh, no, it's raccoons. Like, it's very <laughs> much... <laughs> The loudest raccoons of all time. (laughs) Truly. (laughs) I'm glad they get eaten. I'm glad. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, it's the first movie is is doing something different. It's much more of like a horror movie. And I think that even though people say A Quiet Place Part 2 is scarier, to me, Mm. it was absolutely not scarier, but it was a lot more exciting. Right. There are Mm -hmm. incredibly well-designed action sequences in this, which are really fun to watch and, and very well directed, I think, by John Krasinski. One well, tension, really high tension. Like, Definitely. Some of those sequences, I was gripping my husband's hand. That <laughs> yes. was freaking yeah. out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think it's interesting because the jump scares, I didn't find most of them scary because I feel like they were so telegraphed. It always felt like the camera would just be like, oh, they definitely were. Now here's an empty window, like in the frame, sort of too big in the frame. Like, okay, something's going to appear at that window in a second. But I agree, the action sequences are really cool. And, you know, we did a whole video about cross cutting too. And there are two really good crosscut sequences in this movie where it does all of the things we said equal stakes equal sort of ratcheting up of you know uh, of yes. pacing and that kind of thing and then sort of pay off all at the same time where you feel like everything is happening at once and, mm-hmm. in a really cool way I, th- mm-hmm. those are some of my favorite parts of the movie definitely one of the things that i liked about the first quiet place is that it had this kind of less is more approach to it and that it was very focused on whatever kind of sequence it's being is being set up here and and a lot of that was relying on how quiet it was but it was like very much we are now watching emily blunt must give birth but can't make sound and you are going to experience the most stressful possible version of that for (laughs) as long as you can take it right i appreciated that they kind of double down on that on that the less is more i guess i should also mention i didn't see any trailers i knew nothing about this movie i didn't Mm. know killian murphy was in it i was like surprise killian murphy that's cool I really liked the opening sequence. I was a little worried, but you know, the opening sequence is this like, let's jump back in time. Let's look at day one. You're getting to see what it was like when these aliens arrived. I feel like that was really well done. It's also Mm -hmm. for the crazy people that see A Quiet Place Part 2 and not Part 1. It's also giving you that exposition of like, this is what this world is. Well, sort of. Yeah, not all the pieces. That's one thing I'd be interested to, I don't know, hear from somebody who does somehow go see this and like gets dragged to the theater maybe and just hasn't seen the first one because it definitely feels like this is not one of those sequels that you can just pick up, you know, like I feel like Mm. if you didn't see the first one, you're going to be pretty at sea for most of this. In terms of character. Yeah. And in terms of theme. Yeah. um, Which I want to get to theme later and how it relies on the themes from the first one and doesn't have any themes of its own. Mm. (laughs) But there's, but yeah, it gives you a little bit of exposition, but even that it doesn't give you a ton of exposition for the, that either. Right. But I guess I, I, that's kind of what I like about it too, is that, you know, as soon as I realized, okay, flashback, you're going to explain what happened. I was bracing for, they're going to explain too much. They're going to go too far. Okay. And I really liked, how focused and small and you know wasn't worried about what was happening other places it was like we're gonna mm-hmm. follow john krasinski and emily blunt and their family and how this event affected them and how that kind of set up their characters for the first one and tease killian murphy you know knowing that he's gonna have to come back and set up the dive sign language which mm-hmm. comes back it did enough stuff besides just being like a flashback to see what was cool and i feel like that's kind of how i felt about the rest of the movie too is that there were these sequences that were bigger i think like you're saying trisha definitely more action thriller oriented but like still stressful and still focused on the characters and the mechanics of how they're going to get out of the situation Mm -hmm. but in new fresh ways like the kid with the baby in the vault with the oxygen Uh like it's the first time they went into that room Uh, the most stressful (laughs) thing i cannot ever yeah that's like one of my deepest darkest fears is like being like buried alive and running out like yeah so that was awful and so i just i appreciated they (laughs) they still did those things and made the movie about that and those experiences yeah you brought up the uh the birth sequence from the first movie and i think that one maybe downside is the first movie 
set my expectations for so many of those kinds of moments because the first movie you have Mm -hmm. the opening sequence with the sun obviously like good god yep and old man in the woods the nail the birth the silo the flooding basement you know the ending it was just so many of like oh man i can't wait to watch this movie again to see that scene Mm -hmm. and i think this movie just didn't have a lot of that for me it was like solid movie i had a really good time the oxygen that you were just talking about that was one of the sequences where it was like, ooh, this is really cool. And some of the cross-cut sequences like I talked about, but there's just very little that's making me go, oh man, I wish I could go, like, I want to go see it again tomorrow. Or I want to, I can't wait till it comes out so I can watch it at home. And maybe when I do watch it again, those things will develop. But I feel like the first movie just had so many, not just shocking, but like big punch you in the face type moments that just felt like so satisfying one after the other. And this movie just felt like it was like, good the whole way through and that's kind of where almost where it ends for me Hmm. yeah more inventive sort of sequences i think in the opening yeah in the first movie which is how i felt too like that silo sequence is still something that i've never like had never seen and Mm. have not seen duplicated it's just a set piece with a cool idea or like a cool premise at its heart that feels really unique and interesting. And there are a couple here. Like, mm-hmm, definitely. I actually think the one on the docks is pretty cool. Yeah. Um, yeah where mm-hmm. they, yeah, where they run into these gavages. They yeah. They're the Mad <laughs> Max <laughs> people or like. Right. They wandered out of The Last of Us or something. Yeah. Little zombie girl. <laughs> yes, exactly. But even that, it's like one of the coolest sequences in this. And so is the one in the furnace tank that they're in Mm -hmm. um, where they're running out of air. Those are cool sequences, but they don't quite have the just sort of sparkle to them where you're just like, I've never seen that before. That's so weird and cool. And I can't wait to see what happens next. Yeah. With both films, probably they don't hold up to repeat viewings the same way as maybe a a non suspense filled movie does. Cause Mm -hmm. so much of the first viewing is not knowing what's going to happen. Definitely. And and knowing that the first movie killed a kid early on, Mm -hmm. They could do that again. That is in the rule books of the Quiet Place universe to kill kids. So the first viewing is always really harrowing because you're wondering if they're going to do that again. What this movie did really well for me was just set up kind of one big situation that was really bad and just push that one situation all the way to its limits. Mm -hmm. So it's you've got half the family stranded, basically, because you've got the little boy Marcus got his foot to bear traps mm-hmm. and he's screwed. Mm-hmm. He's he's stuck in one place. That moment is crazy. That was a good one. Which was intense. Like I feel like that for me like did what the 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 kid dying in the intro did in the first one for me where it's just like oh the movie just did that. Like it just went from zero to like irreparably bad like very quickly and I think that was very effective. Mm-hmm. So I'll continue. Right. It, just the setup of their situation is already like worst case scenario in a lot of different ways, um, which is great. And so I think what's interesting about this movie is you're right. It's not about a bunch of different ways to screw with the silence and to break the silence and to kind of use that premise. It's more about setting up, let's put all the characters on different paths and having to split up for various reasons. And then with that intercut sequence, which I guess is kind of in the end of act two, actually kind of bring that one big scenario to a head to its worst possible outcome before the heroes have a comeback and just barely make it out Mm -hmm. of this thing. So it's in in some ways it's kind of simpler, but I also liked, I, I was into it, at least on my first viewing, I was kind of down with it just being, one really horrible scenario pushed all the way in all the different directions. There are parts before the intercut sequence where I was just thinking the movie is going here. Oh my God. I really thought the Killian Murphy character Emmett was going to be that guy who takes all of uh, Reagan's stuff Mm. and takes her earpiece and just like abandons her. Mm -hmm. And the movie made me think that it was going to go there for a moment. And I almost wish it did go there, but I, I like that it, it did. I, I believe this world can go to these places. And the movie brought me all the way to the edge of that. I believe this movie could kill Marcus. You know, or, or, or I mean, I didn't think it could kill a baby. No, you can't. <laughs> right. It's, you know, John Krasinski wouldn't kill a baby. Right. But I, I, I was thinking that some of the unthinkable things could happen because a lot of it is because of the first movie, which is an interesting mm-hmm. thing to think about. I didn't mind that it wasn't a series of set pieces because. 
I believed this one set piece could go a lot of different ways. Mm. And I was waiting to see how it was going to go. And I think for me, there's like a meta aspect also that's playing into this where the sequel, I mean, they were shooting, I think, like within a year of the first movie coming out Mm -hmm. or something kind Mm. of crazy like that. And I think that that's always one of my concerns when I hear Yep. There's a sequel coming and it's coming out right away. And it's like, oh, cool. No one had time to write that movie. I wonder what it's going to be like. For me, there there was this kind of meta comfort once I realized, okay, cool. Like you're not going to try to reach any further than where we are now. And you're just going to make where we are as good as possible. And I think that's kind of like a good, the meta lesson there, I think was smart of like, we can't, don't reach too far, just like expand it as much as you need to create a cool new situation. And then the things that we do have time to spend time on, which is like making these sequences as fun as possible, do that 100% and make Mm -hmm. that. So I think that's just a smart way to approach a sequel in this kind of situation where it's like, studio liked it. Now we need another one tomorrow. Right. And Mm -hmm. maybe now they've had more time in a kind of silver lining (laughs) way to plan a third one (laughs) Uh Mm -hmm. that... uh, can maybe do both, like reach further and have the time to really nail it. That's what I'm going to hope. That'd be interesting. Yeah, yeah. If the third one could really do it all somehow. <laughs> well, I would have been really curious to see what part two would have looked like with Beck and Woods, who wrote the original yeah. script for the first movie, because I feel like the sort of Lennon McCartney thing happening there was that Beck and Woods wrote this script that wasn't necessarily going to be a great movie, but was so powerfully communicating this sense of the sound, the quiet and everything, and also this family dynamic and this this idea of kind of guilt and, and, and dynamic between the parents and the kids. And then John Krasinski very smartly took that and turned it into a, a very solid movie. I think he took his very solid movie and made a very solid sequel that just feels like on the surface, everything is working but doesn't have maybe the guts that the first movie had with that original script. Well, and that was my exact thought, Bri, as I walked out of this movie, which is I was expecting the movie to aim higher and for that reason, potentially fail harder. Mm. It didn't do either one of those things. Right. It didn't really aim that high. It didn't do a lot to get into the backstory of the aliens or to, you know, we talked about didn't introduce like a a queen alien or expand on the (laughs) alien's ability. And there aren't like thousands of them. Right. Um, Again, going back to our, our video about sequels, you know, increasing the scale of the, the antagonist, right. Or I think we phrased it, intensify the antagonist, Mm -hmm. you know, in some way, give, make the antagonist more powerful. And they didn't really do that here. There's still just a couple of creatures. There's not, you know, a flood of them or something like that. And it doesn't really push the boundaries of the world or or even really the characters. And for that reason, it didn't fail big. Right. 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 Exactly what you're saying, Michael. They took the directive, presumably from the studio of make a sequel, don't mess it up. And you know what? They didn't. Mm. They didn't mess it up. It's good. (laughs) Yeah. It's a really good movie. It's a really fun ride, you know, and it, it's a hell of a movie to watch in the theater, especially right now. Like, right. there's a lot that kind of worked out for this movie. And yes, it's because the building blocks of it from the first movie are so solid. Mm-hmm. You took absolutely the best things from the first movie, Millicent Simmons, mm-hmm. <laughs> Emily Blunt. <clears throat> and mm-hmm. you you took those amazing characters and the relationships that we care about from the first movie and a really interesting premise from the first movie and just transplanted them into this sort of action thriller thing and, you know, didn't mess up any of it. Just kind of let all of those things be what they are, which was already good. So good job. Right, because half the things you said sound like they would be awful. Where it's like, oh, now we know where the aliens, totally. like what they, their origin story. Like, we don't want that. I don't yeah, want. We it. don't want the to hear like what the government is doing or whatever. You know what I mean? That no. kind of thing. So I agree that it's like aiming higher in that direction would have maybe made for a harder fail. So then it ends up they end up just sort of like, good job, you did a you did a good thing, mm-hmm. you did it solidly. Thumbs up. Yeah, and again, most sequels don't manage that. Right. Like, I feel like that's why, you know, and and I think I 
also respect like John Krasinski's filmmaking. Like I, I think yeah. there's the things that I liked about it in the first one, I like about it here. And one of them is just, I think he trusts that the audience is smart. Like there's never mm -hmm. a part where, uh, you know, thinking about the furnace tank thing where someone sits down and says, I have to set a timer because when that timer goes off, that means there's no more oxygen and then we right. won't be able to breathe air anymore. Like that would have been in every <laughs> right, right. other version of this movie, but they just don't even like they trust you to put the pieces together. And I really I like I think that helps elevate it for me beyond just the like you did a good it's like right. you did a good and you also did it goodly. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I totally agree. And that's such a huge part of filmmaking and trusting your audience and stuff. The only negative I have with that regard is with the ending, because they are asking for a lot of inference there. Because basically it's like they got the cochlear implant on the radio thing. So now hopefully they keep that running. Hopefully there are people out there actually picking up that station. Hopefully when those people pick up that station, they accidentally attract an alien close enough that it goes, you know, if they're, if they're being smart enough to not make sounds around the alien, then they're not going to be listening to the radio super loud. Then the alien has to get close enough to them that they realize this thing is going to cause it a weakness. Then they have to realize it's we enough of a weakness that they can, you know, hit it with a stick and basically it'll die. So it's just, it's asking for us to infer a lot. And, and I can infer all those things. I can infer eventually, and maybe this is what part three is, but like eventually enough people will figure out that this crazy sound coming out of this radio thing is, is a tool, but it left me feeling a little flat at the end without actually seeing the wider effect. You know, if, if quiet place mm -hmm. one is about, the family learning to survive, then we see the resolution of that when in those final moments of, of the first movie where it's like, ch -ch boom, you know, yeah. like we're like, oh, cool, we see this. If Quiet Place 2 is about the family getting the message out there so that other humans can survive, but we never see those other humans, then you're asking us to infer that this like great thing has happened without actually really giving us, showing us it happening. I completely disagree, but I think maybe Alex does too. So Alex, do you want to? <laughs> well, the ending is interesting because it did end suddenly for me as yeah. well. I wasn't expecting that moment to be the ending. And that's where I was kind of confused structurally in the movie. I was doing my screenwriter brain mm -hmm. analysis as the movie was going on. And as I mentioned earlier, I, I, I thought that kind of intercut sequence was the midpoint mm -hmm. and that we had a lot more movie left, but it really was actually we were getting into act three around that point, the kind of final showdown on the island and the final showdown with Emily Blunt getting back to the mine or whatever that was. <laughs> the <laughs> underground place. The indus industrial place. Yeah. So, okay, I was feeling a little bit like, whoa, okay, it's over. That was it. But the movie was interesting because it, it also was very clearly trying to show a character change for Marcus, the, the boy, and some kind of like a, it's almost like a revenge victory for Regan, the way she kills the monster. And there's kind of this low angle shot of her mm -hmm. after she kills it. It kind of her like victory pose, almost like getting revenge or owning the monsters that killed her right. father. I do love the kids getting those like victories at the end. Like mm -hmm. that was really fun. And it was interesting because yeah, I, I wasn't really expecting it, but then it seemed like it also positioned the story to be about Marcus finding courage a little, it felt a little bit weird that his courage was like, I'm going to blast you with a gun, you know, as, as like the beautiful moment that made Emily Blunt like cry. Um, <laughs> but, but in this world, it makes sense. Right. Like in this yeah. world, you know, to take care of yourself and your family, you got to blast aliens with guns. So yep. it's heroic and, and beautiful at that moment, I guess. At that moment, I realized, okay, no, the movie was actually about this, I think, or John Krasinski wants me to feel. And it's not really about the wider world that you're talking about, Brian, like her getting to the station and accomplishing her mission isn't really about the mission as much as it is her kind of taking her dad's mantle, I guess, and carrying forth what he would have done if he were still there, uh, protecting the family and trying to do the right thing. So yeah, the ending was interesting for me because I both had the reaction of like, oh, that's it. And also simultaneously realizing, oh, I think there is something else that was supposed to be the main point of this movie that I just kind of now I'm getting. <laughs> so do you guys want to play a fun game of name that theme? <laughs> <laughs> First, Michael, did you have different thoughts than I had about, about all that? No. Well, I, I think, I, I think what you're, you're summing up and 
where we're going to go with the theme conversation, I think is all spot on. I was also surprised, but was immediately like, oh, great, cool, we're done, we're out. Like, in the same way that I, I liked that about the first A Quiet Place, like, right. It's not that we see them learn how to kill a monster and then we watch them go and kill monsters for another 10 minutes. It's like, okay, we have, we've achieved the thing. We have the knowledge, chick, chick, cut to black. And I like that it was similar here too of like the kids have accomplished their goal and now like this message has been broadcast to the world. We have achieved the thing that we wanted to do in this movie, cut to black. But I am in agreement that it wasn't until those last moments that I was like, oh, that's what this movie was about. I guess it was about these kids growth. Like, mm -hmm. okay, that's the theme. Neat. And like re quickly, <laughs> right. retrospectively, I could fill it in and be like, okay, yeah, sure. Right. That wasn't the storyline dramatic question that I was hanging on. Of the, like, will they right. learn courage or bravery today? Yeah, like, mm -hmm. will Marcus shoot the alien in the face? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it's a little bit like what I said when we talked about Lost in Translation of like a movie like that or No Country for Old Men where you're not expecting it to end when it does. So then you have to kind of go back in your brain and like recalculate, you know, and that's how this movie mm -hmm. felt to me. It was like, if I think about the whole movie, the movie as a whole, then the ending is satisfying. But when you don't realize it's the ending until the credits roll, you're like, oh, OK, as you said, Alex, I thought there was more coming, but that was it. OK, so now I have to like recalibrate and go back and, and like mm -hmm. put the movie back together in my head. I love a movie with a quick ending mm -hmm. there's something really awesome when you just get out of a movie while the getting's good and <laughs> you know yeah. ending on like a really great action-y sort of high note you know where there's the victory and you're done i'm with you yes good and of course there's this now it now i guess they're making it a thing so with a quiet place three it's gonna have a quick ending guys like it's just gonna be or if it's the final part, right? Maybe it'll have a long end. It'll have a whole parade, and like they all get medals, and yeah, it's right. It'll be Return of the King. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> now it's like a franchise, like Hallmark, <laughs> quick ending. Right, right. <laughs> but I do think that there is not enough theme in the text here. Ultimately, like what you guys are talking about is we are very generously looking at the conclusion and going back and filling in thematic gaps that I think very much exist in the text of this movie where I, you know, having rewatched the first one today, the first one is very much about the parents and it's very much about parenting. Right. And mm -hmm. who are we, if we can't protect them. Right. That's like sort mm -hmm. of ultimately the thematic question at the heart of the first movie. And it's about, you know, the responsibility of parenting and, and the way that you see yourself, you know, what is the imperative there um, in your relationship with your children, right? It's very clear textually because they have a conversation about it <laughs> mm -hmm. in the first movie. In this movie, first of all, in so many ways, it's relying on you to have seen the first movie, but it doesn't have the same themes at all. And yet there's almost no thematic discussion in this film. And so when we met the Killian Murphy character, I was thinking, oh, okay, this movie is thematically about that then. It's about, you know, who do we become in in situations where it's our family or someone else's. Right. And I was halfway expecting this movie to be about, you know, if the first movie is about a family learns to save itself and support each other, then this movie is about a community learns to save itself and support each other. I was sort of looking for that theme in here, maybe, where they have to rebuild trust in the community and like neighbors need to learn how to trust each other again and that kind of thing. That's not what this movie's about. <laughs> uh, it doesn't seem, right? Because it's just, it gets really muddy when they eventually do meet a community, but this movie's also not super interested in the redemption of Killian Murphy's character. It's mm -hmm. sort of interested in it, like there's a little bit there, but it's sort of unclear how and why he needs redemption or how far gone he really is when we first meet him. I did feel like he came around too quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, like mm -hmm. I, I, I liked that. I thought he might have just stolen Reagan's stuff I love that and too. left her. And then from that point on, when he didn't, he's basically good. He's just a good guy from that point on. And I think that was one thing that disappointed me a bit with his character was I thought he did have a lot of room to grow and he kind of switched gears too quickly 
for my taste and it didn't feel as earned. But how is that related to Marcus's arc? And how is Marcus's arc related to Regan's arc? They kind of are not. And so again, I was thinking, okay, well, maybe in this movie, the first movie is about parenting. Then maybe this is a coming of age story where it's like right. the children, you know, coming into their own. The parents no longer need to protect them. Well, that's a beautiful idea for a second, you know, evolution of a theme in the next movie. And I feel like that's kind of ultimately what it decides that it's about later. But you would love to see that theme, you know, a different take on it or sort of reflected in the Killian Murphy character or sort of other people in the community sort of wrestling with this idea. It's just a little bit of a mess. And there's just not a lot of it in the text where we're left sort of having to read a bunch of stuff into it that actually kind of isn't in there. With the obvious caveat that a lot of people don't care if their movies have themes. But <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting because Regan's character, talking about arcs, it almost like she had a flat arc. We, we talked about mm. Mulan recently and, and a Patreon exclusive. And in Mulan, you know, Mulan doesn't really change. Like she has her beliefs and her goals and she knows who she wants to be and the people around her change because of her. Mm. And it seemed very similar in this movie uh, with uh, Regan. She is determined from the very beginning. She's never really scared the way Marcus is. She's determined from the very beginning to go on this mission, save other people, do what her dad would have done. And it's really her that changes Emmett, That's interesting. The mm-hmm. Murphy character. So, so I, I, I did. I like that about her character having kind of that flat arc. But once again, I, I don't know how that ties in with Marcus so well. It, it doesn't have that co, yeah, you know, that cohesive thematic feeling where it's like, oh yeah, that's what this movie was about. There is a lot of that effort on my part at the end. Oh, it ended suddenly. Okay, so that last part was meaningful. The movie must mean this. Mm-hmm. I'm going to try to figure it out now. <laughs> yeah, the ending is interesting, and and I think it does kind of still fall into this umbrella of like. You know, it didn't aim too high, so it didn't miss. Mm -hmm. But there are things that are lost when you don't aim too high. And I feel like this kind of thematic cohesion like we're talking about is is definitely something that is missing and doesn't make it feel as, I don't know, profound is the wrong word. I don't Mm. think the first one is profound, but there's not as much meaning in Mm -hmm. it, I think. Right, right. You know, it's still fun, but not as much meaning. I liked it. I'm I'm ready for the third one. I'm a little worried they're going to aim high and miss, but <laughs> I'll, I'll be there in the theater to watch it. I also just want to reemphasize just how amazing the opening sequence was in theaters mm. yeah, for the first time. Really like, I just, I love that opening sequence so much. So nerve wracking, so awesome, so well choreographed. Mm-hmm. Some of the longer takes of action, really impressive filmmaking all around yeah. there. Some of the visual effects where they had to replace the windows because the reflections of the camera would have been in there were a little bit distracting. Right, mm. guys? You you guys were paying attention to that? Yeah. <laughs> it was the first thing I saw. <laughs> I noticed the wipe, the like, the blend oh, when the, the he, yeah. the, the, the cop car pulls up behind him and it's like not parked yet. Right. And then he like opens the door and the cop car is like fully parked right. and the guy's like already out of it. Right. It's like you blended two shots there very clearly. Somebody saw 1917. But besides <laughs> that, I did not yeah, I did not notice. I did not notice anything else. Right. So that was just Michael. <laughs> nice. Well, before we go into lessons, uh, I want to take a moment to thank all the patrons who support this show. Uh, and as a reminder, as a supporter on Patreon, you get to vote in our patron exclusive episodes. The vote in May was super, super mm-hmm. close. Mm-hmm. One vote decided it between Mulan and the Lion King. And there was a lot of heated debate and threatening happening uh, on the Discord. <laughs> but besides votes for Disney <laughs> movies, it's a very wonderful, great community. So if you're enjoying <laughs> Beyond the Screen Play, we'd Really appreciate your support. Head over to patreon.com slash beyond the screenplay. Okay, so lessons from A Quiet Place Part 2. Alex, do you want to start us off? Michael, I love what you mentioned earlier about how the movie doesn't spoon feed you mm-hmm. the rules of the world that you need to know. Like it, it trusts the audience to be smart enough to be observing, to be watching, to be studying what the characters are doing and to pick up on what's happening. And we talked about how this movie kind of has this one big situation that goes really awry. And that situation really relies on a lot of rules. You have to rely on the rule about the oxygen with the baby and the level of oxygen left in the tank. It relies on the fact that this furnace latch has a setting with the blanket, but not with the blanket and you're trapped inside. There's the timer on the watch that lets you know when you run out of oxygen. All None of that stuff is said. Like mm-hmm. nobody talks about any of those rules, but the movie shows you all of them enough times before things go really wrong so that when he goes in the furnace and it like 
slams shut. Yeah. And you know he's not going to be able to get out. The whole audience gasped. And th- that's a great <laughs> feeling when it's like, oh, you did it, movie. Everybody got the rules. They understand it. And they know exactly how screwed up this is. Uh, so I think it's just a great example of how to set up rules without having to do lame exposition, over explaining everything. Yeah, and, and how important it is to set up in a, in a thriller suspense horror movie. Rules are kind of everything in these situations. And if we don't understand the rules, if we don't know he's going to run out of oxygen in that furnace, then that whole sequence is meaningless. It's a great example of setting up rules and setting them up without dumb, bad dialogue exposition. So I think it's great. It's a great study for that kind of uh, writing. And keeping the rules consistent, because I think that's something yes. that sequels can kind of screw up also. is like, well, now they've evolved and they have an extra ear that can hear some of the time <laughs> or whatever. I was watching for that in the movie, actually. You know, are they going to be more slippery with the rules or be less consistent because we're in sequel land? And, and they right. weren't. They were really consistent. And even Emily Blunt's really clever, crazy way of both blowing up the alien a little bit, but also t- <laughs> turning on the sprinklers to make sure there was water sounds to cover up her footsteps. Mm-hmm. All that right. was felt very much of the first movie. So very good job, both evolving the first movie and keeping it consistent and having rules that we can all understand and follow and believe in. My lesson is actually a little bit related to that, which is just an appreciation of really grounded action sequences. Mm. There are aliens in this world, but that is the only unrealistic thing right. that's happening in this world. Every other thing is incredibly grounded. And the first movie, I think one of the things that makes these both of these films so visceral in the way that we respond to them, you guys were highlighting some of it earlier, are the just sort of like human problems, like physical human like frailty. Mm-hmm. That's being exploited by these movies where mm. we run out of air. We step on nails on our own basement steps, which mm-hmm. turns into a really big situation. You know, we give birth, which is a really intense, you know, unsolvable problem in a world where you have to be quiet. Right. Where mm-hmm. the first movie set a really strong precedent for that level of grounding in the action sequences. These are not superheroes. They don't really have special powers or abilities. In fact, They are, you know, saddled with all of this sort of like human weakness. And that's what makes them interesting to watch in the way that they figure it out. The bear trap being an incredible example of that, (laughs) Mm -hmm, where mm -hmm. the minute he steps in that bear trap, you're just like, well, (laughs) (laughs) yeah, it's over. (laughs) Yeah, right. Yikes. Uh, And yeah, and and it's over, right? That kid is not going anywhere Mm -hmm. for the rest of this movie. And he's going to start screaming. Like right. really loud. Because how yeah. can you not? Right. Exactly. In a normal action movie, he would just be like, okay, wrap it up really quick with a bandage. We're going to keep going. Right. Right. You right. know, but this is not, these films are not like that. These films are determined to stay as grounded as they possibly can. The fact that there's a baby in these movies, to put a baby in an action movie mm-hmm. is just an incredibly grounded. And again, this visceral choice where we're just like, the baby is in peril. Yeah, like right. real peril. <laughs> the baby doesn't have oxygen. <laughs> <laughs> it's horrifying. And, and I think it is a hallmark of both of these films. And so I just really appreciate that. And then, you know, going into the the later sort of sequences in this film, they also sort of rely on that same, you know, designing principle for their action sequences where they have to, they're on the docks and the, he's got like a, noisemaker around him (laughs) essentially where if he moves he makes noise and so he can't move right right it's very simple but again it's relying sort of on this is just a very practical thing that might happen to you if you're a person in this world the rules of being a person are not action movie rules Mm -hmm. they are Mm -hmm. real life rules and that works really really well here when you have a sci-fi premise staying grounded with everything else is a really smart decision it, it sucks you into the experience, I feel like, in a way where yes. you you can imagine what would I do in that situation because it's a situation you could be in. Right. Like, I don't know what I would do if I was Iron Man in certain situations. Right. Uh, because I don't know what my options are or what my limitations <laughs> are. Right. Yes. But when I'm trapped in a place with running out of oxygen and I also need to take care of this like baby I can be thinking in the theater dear god what do I do <laughs> right. I need some to help but how much do you like yeah it's it makes it 
visceral, like you're saying. And I think it's mm-hmm. yeah, really, really good. Yes. Yeah. Brian, what about you? Uh, my lesson is about the value of an impossible situation, mm. which this movie has a lot of, you know, characters trapped, usually cornered by a monster, of course, and we have just no idea how they're going to get out of it. And, and that's not something that's limited to horror. It can be a character trying to hide their boyfriend in their bedroom from their dad or something, right? Like, just <laughs> so like, oh my gosh, how we don't know. We know all the rules in what you have shown us to this point. Our brain is racking the rules trying to, <laughs> yes. uh, to, mm. to find a solution here, you know? Mm-hmm. And I think that tends to be when I'm the most engaged and on the edge of my seat in a movie like this is when I'm trying to figure out like, oh, how's this going to, how's this character going to get out of this? But then you also have to be careful with how you finally get the character out of the situation, you know? So one mm-hmm. end of the spectrum, you have deus ex machina, uh, where uh, how's this character going to get themselves out of the situation? Oh, they're not. A bus is going to come by and hit the, you know, so whatever. Mm-hmm. Right. You get a little of that with um, with Emmett saving Regan in the uh, in the train car, where it's like, mm-hmm. oh, what's she going to do? What's she going to do? Oh, someone's going to show up and yeah. blow the character's head off. Okay. Alien, aliens head off. <laughs> yes, yes, the, the aliens head off. <laughs> the alien character. It's a character. <laughs> okay. Aliens are people. That, that was Phil. <laughs> 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 but uh but you know yes and i think that can make it makes it feel undeserved because you feel like it mm-hmm. didn't you know it sort of didn't yeah. solve it the problem didn't solve itself it just sort of got solved and on the other end of the spectrum which you also get some of in this movie is the sort of very obvious setup and payoff right where it's you know a character saying early in the movie this is just generic but like you know one of these days that ceiling's gonna cave in all it would take is a solid knock on that wall and then you know an hour later when the bad guy is under that ceiling you're just waiting for the good guy to figure out go to the wall idiot like we the movie already told us and uh so i I think it's like put your characters in an impossible situation make them get themselves out of it but in a way that's not too obvious a little obvious is fine because it's it's really fun to have setups and payoff it's really fun to sort of figure it out right before the movie does it for you you know but it's like if you don't see it coming at all or if you see it coming from a mile away it's sort of unrewarding in both cases so right. it's like mm-hmm. impossible situation and then find that nice balance of how you're going to actually get out of it mm-hmm. forget which screenwriting book it says this in but i remember like when i first read it back in like film school me being angry at how accurate it was but it was something sort of like the thing that happens in the climax should be completely unexpected but make perfect sense right. immediately uh-huh. at the same time yep and it's that like that little in between zone where it's like you didn't see it coming but as soon as it happens it's like oh yeah it makes perfect sense of right. course that's what yeah it's hard to hit that target i'm a little bummed that we didn't get a lot of signing in this movie Mm. Yeah. because mm. they pair her with Emmett who can't sign right yeah I was like hoping for more of that like you know the character's superpower right to come because mm-hmm. it kind of is her like special ability right and so and it's used to really great effect in the first movie where the whole family can communicate using their own language essentially and then by splitting the family up which I think is probably the right call you know, it's kind of taking you taking away their like special ability in some ways. Right. Not that Millicent Simmons isn't amazing in this because mm-hmm. she definitely is. And yeah. you know, there's like lots of she does like a lot of other amazing things in this movie, but they definitely are departing from that. And so I don't know. I That's kind of I'm only bringing it up because I was expecting that to be a payoff. Mm hmm you know, in like sort of a problem solving kind of way. And they set it up with the dive where he knows one sign. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> that's the sign that he needs to sign to her. Where I'm Conveniently. Like, okay. Yeah. That's kind of what you're talking about, right, Brian? Yeah, where yeah. it's like, mm, okay, okay. But I was like kind of hoping for something of that, something like that at the climax where they have their own thing or way of communicating or whatever. Yeah, I do feel like the climax was the least exciting in some ways of for the movie for me but also i just i as soon as i got to an island and there were lots of people i was like uh i don't know about any of this is like <laughs> okay but like the perfect happy community as like the rest of the world is gone right. <laughs> I, I will say one of the best parts of the finale for me was just a simple shot of her foot yeah going past a coffee mug dealing with a drawer yes. and it's like that is what where these movies excel is just right. finding yes. a way to make that shot the most suspenseful thing yeah, yeah, ever. Yeah. Right. She's like yeah. stepping over the window. Right. Yeah. yeah I, I feel like I wanted to I kind of like too many lessons because we already talked about the sort of meta thing of as a sequel aiming low feels like the wrong 
<laughs> like it has the, the wrong connotation to it. Well, don't bite off more than you can chew. Right. Yeah. There I think it's like be smart about your scope so that you can focus on doing a quality job with like time and the resources that you have. Mm -hmm. That kind of restraint and discipline is really hard to self-enforce. And so I think I like it when I see it in movies. And I think it's good to say out loud and, and remind people of. But also about Marcus's arc. I was, as we talked about, surprised a little bit that it was, oh, okay, this was about Marcus finding courage in the end. But thinking back, I think what I liked about Marcus in both movies is that he's just really afraid. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's cool that Regan sort of gets her dad's bravery and is like, I'm not afraid. I'm going to do what needs to happen. But as someone that is a scaredy cat, I really appreciated the representation of just like, <laughs> this is a terrifying situation that you find yourself in. Yeah. And so when he did have that ending where he killed the monster with the help of his big sister and her accomplishment like that actually did kind of do something for me because I understood how much of a transformation that was for him and like how terrifying it would be to march toward a huge scary alien and kill it with a gun that you don't know how to shoot like <laughs> I bought all of that I think that just helps kind of ground the movie more that there's a character that's perpetually afraid and has to kind of slowly overcome that I appreciate that. I mean, that's kind of no Jupe's thing. <laughs> like, <laughs> I've seen a lot of movies where it's just him looking just really scared of everything. Mm, I've never seen him in anything else. We, we've mentioned Alien and Aliens. It's always really important in all of these types of movies to have at least one character that is adequately freaking out in a yes. way that most of us would. You know, like if we were actually facing the terror of the situation, most of us would melt into a puddle of terror like, like right yeah. most of us are not that brave right so i really appreciate it when movies have at least one character that rep represents that reality and and i always also identify with that character right again <laughs> grounding like right. in a sci-fi movie you got to stay grounded in so many other ways to keep us with everybody and having a character that tells us by the expression on their face how scared we're supposed to be is a great character to have yes mm -hmm. yeah what have you guys been watching? Trisha, what have you been watching recently? I started watching Halt and Catch Fire, which was an AMC show, and it is now on your Netflix. And I'm really enjoying it. I'm in the middle of season two. There are four seasons. So if you have finished it, don't tell me. <laughs> but it's uh, you know starring Lee Pace and Scoop McNary and... Um, Mackenzie Davis. Thank you. Like, oh, cool. She's tall. All she's, right. That's she's tall. Very nice. <laughs> and yeah, it, it's it's about you know, people in the computer industry in the early 1980s. And they're basically the first season is they're trying to build a PC and beat IBM. Essentially, they're sort of like a scrappy, you know, electronics company. It's kind of doing a Mad Men thing, like, or it's really feels like it's really trying hard to do a Mad Men thing. Really trying. He says really AMC, right? Yeah, it is. Yeah. <laughs> and Lee Pace, who I love with all of my heart and is great in this, is kind of trying to do a Don Draper thing where he's like the visionary and he's also a total jerk. Then you have this sort of Scoop McNary's character is like a hardware guy. And it's a, you know, this workplace drama about a changing time in American history and the relationships of people both at work and their relationships with their families. So it's like a, a lot of big part of it is about- Did you Scoop pitch the show to AMC? <laughs> I feel like I did. Well, so I've been meaning to watch it forever because it feels like the most me show sort of ever, you know, along with Mad Men. If Trisha has deigned to watch television, then it must be good, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> so far, it's not on Mad Men's level in terms of like symbolism, like the mm. sort of rich- mm -hmm symbolic thematic thing that we've talked about with Mad Men before. It, it's not quite, it hasn't quite reached that level, but the cast is just so wonderful to watch. And it is like about a fun sort of corner of, you know, American life where they're playing on their PCs and they're like inventing modems and, you know, inventing chat rooms and, and that kind of thing. And I don't know. I, I'm having a good time. So if anyone's a Halt and Catch Fire fan, uh, definitely would love to talk more about it to some people. Cool. So you can tweet at me about but it. But don't spoil it for you. <laughs> right. Do not spoil it for me. Yeah, that was an interesting show when that was coming out because it was right in AMC's like 
golden hour, right? When it was like oh, Mad yeah. Men, Walking Dead, Breaking Bad. And then it was like, oh, they have another show coming out. So like, what's this going to be? And then it came out and it didn't make this huge splash. And everyone I know has seen it has said it's great and they love it. But I just think it was like at the time, it was like with every show knocking it out of the park, right. it just became the show that was like, hi, I'm here too. And everyone's like, okay, that's fine. And then it just didn't for whatever <laughs> reason find that audience. Yeah, they can't all be Mad Men, I uh -huh. guess. Um, and, you know, it's probably not fair to compare this to Mad Men, except that I feel like it is inviting that comparison at every level. But <laughs> <laughs> but Lee Pace is, is really tall and really gorgeous in it. Um, and so is Mackenzie Davis. So something for everyone. If you're into really tall, really tall, gorgeous <laughs> people with 80s sort of looks to them. <laughs> this is your show. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Brian, what have you been watching? Uh, so after rewatching and discussing and helping with a video on Portrait of a Lady on Fire, um, I wanted to watch more Celine Siama movies. Ooh. Nice. So I watched all of them. Good job. Nice. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so in order, it's Water Lilies, Tomboy, and Girlhood, which interesting, they're all great. And all four of her movies have female protagonists, but the first three all have teenage female protagonists. So they're all within age like maybe 11 to 16 or something. And uh, I guess sort of that was what she was known for at which she started making, you know, her like second, third movie was like, oh, you're capturing this sort of reality of childhood. And the first two, especially you've seen Water Lilies, right, Trisha? Mm -hmm. uh, that and Tomboy definitely have this sort of indie film, like you're just kind of hanging out with people kind of feeling. And then uh, Girlhood feels more like a, a, a movie movie, like, oh, I'm watching there's style here and it's very, you know, cinematic. And, and that was my favorite, uh, but they're all great. I recommend watching them all. I recommend watching them in order because it's always fun to see one, someone's debut and how, like what things they're already solid at and then which things they pick up along the way. Like mm -hmm. if she had gone from either of her first two movies to Portrait of a Lady on Fire, it would be like, what? But when you watch them in order, it's like, oh, okay, girlhood, I see this confidence here and I see this skill, mm -hmm. even though it's, completely opposite movie from portrait it just still feels like okay but i could see how you like the next step up for you would be to make uh that movie they're, they're also most i think three out of four of her movies are, are queer narratives so you can see that she is always telling a very personal story but it never feels autobiographical it's always at a distance mm -hmm. like and when she talks about the movie she'll say oh yeah that was that character is kind of based on my sister or this is like a story I read or something like that. It's never just, oh, this is something I went through. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's usually like personal, but at a distance, which is a really cool balance to strike. Nice. Awesome. So yeah, have yourself a Siamathon and just watch everything. <laughs> <laughs> I'm definitely planning on doing that soon. So that's cool. Alex, what about you? So last night I was lying in bed and I opened Netflix on my iPhone and I saw Bo Burnham's Netflix special inside was like, recommended and i've been seeing it on twitter everybody's talking about it on twitter it's all over the place and i really only know bo burnham from his directorial debut eighth grade mm. and his acting in promising young woman i don't really know him wow. for what he's like known for which is being right. this youtube star comedian performer guy and so this was really a treat to get to know him in that light through his latest special which is i think amazing i think if you are a millennial if you are online this is a very cathartic, very hilarious, very entertaining watch. And I, I'm just so impressed with just the master, the masterful satire he's able to accomplish with this weird pandemic like work of art, I would say. So if you fall into the category I, I listed millennial and <laughs> online, you will enjoy this, I believe. Nice. Been meaning to check it out. Yeah, it has songs in it, right? Because he's a phenomenal songwriter. Oh, yeah. it's 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 almost all songs. Yeah. Okay, great. And it's it's all filmed in his apartment during the pandemic. Nice. <laughs> it's, uh, by him, but like really well done. Great lighting, great set pieces. Like he he goes all out in an apartment with lighting and with his camera. It's amazing. Nice. That's yeah. cool. And for those listening, if you're not online, please write us a letter and tell us how, <laughs> yeah. how you are listening to this podcast. Yeah. If you're a millennial without internet, <laughs> yeah, what's happening Send to you? Send us a postcard. <laughs> Telegram. Cool. So I watched, there's a, a new series on Netflix from Vox called Money Explained. It's one of their, you know, they've been doing lots of series 
where they explain things. And this one is on money. <laughs> I see. And uh, it's pretty short. Each episode is like 20, 25 minutes. But I love all of their explained series. And this one, especially, I was thinking about how it feels like, I guess not free, but really accessible education mm. and how they're boiling down these complicated things that everyone in society should know, but no one really teaches us and making it accessible to anyone that has Netflix. And so there are only five episodes and the titles are their subjects, which is Get Rich Quick, Credit Cards, Student Loans, Gambling, and Retirement. Okay. And each one is sort of about, this is how these things work in our society. We're going to explain it really simply. Here's what you should probably be doing with those things. I know it's scary, but we just explained it in a simple way. You should do these things. And then also kind of zooming out and talking about the sociological, economic politics around all of it and why things are so screwed up. And so it's doing everything I like. It's like free advice, it's smart advice, and it's helping you understand the system that we all find ourselves in in a way that makes you feel uh, empowered because knowledge is power. So Money Explained on Netflix. I'm scared to watch this, but I definitely should. <laughs> You need to. Everyone needs to. Do they explain that money is fake? And all all money is fake? They actually don't talk about that. Maybe they just assume. No, not about the philosophy of money. It's just about the, the crushing <laughs> reality of money for millennials in the 21st century. Sure. <laughs> well, and there's a lot of like, uh, you know, if you're, if you're looking for absolution, there's a lot of like, you know. Always. Everyone, yeah, wasn't dealt a fair hand. And things are kind of stacked against you. And part of that stacking is making all this stuff as confusing as possible. So being able to have it explained in a simple way really makes a difference. So highly recommend. Okay. Yeah. Well, this has been our conversation about A Quiet Place Part 2, 12, 15 months later. But we did it. Uh, <laughs> it was very exciting to, uh, yeah, get to, I don't know, felt like coming home. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. It didn't really feel like that, but that's kind of how I feel like it should feel. I don't know. Thank you, everyone, for listening. We want to say thank you, as always, to the patrons that make this show possible. Thank you to our producer, Vince Major, and our editor, Eric Schneider. I'm Michael Tucker, and I've been joined today by Trisha Rand, Brian Bittner, and Alex Cayeros. All of our Twitter handles are in the show notes. Send us a tweet, say hi, and we will see you in the next episode. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.